I'm Tori Bedford, Greater Boston. A look at efforts to ban books across the country with a Brandeis student who just went before Congress to urge targeted books remain available. Then WVZ's Matt Shearer joins me on his award-winning TikToks. Efforts to ban books are at a 20-year high in the United States. More than 1,200 requests came into schools and libraries across the country last year, demanding bans on more than 2,500 books. That's up nearly 40% from the year before, and the vast majority of those books were written by or about members of the LGBTQAI community and people of color. The issue made its way before the Senate Judiciary Committee this week, where Cameron Samuels, who grew up in Texas and now goes to college at Brandeis, shared their experiences with some of the books most targeted by ban requests. Mike Curato's Flamer illustrates a queer Boy Scout bullied and traumatized. I saw myself in the book having faced similar harassment in school. Flamer gave me words for my trauma, but it was banned. Censorship bars students from age-relevant materials, leaving them unable to realize their actions can traumatize others. Cameron joins me now, as does Tracy Griffith, the director of the Racial Justice Program for the ACLU of Massachusetts. Cameron and Tracy, thank you so much for being here. So I'm wondering if you can give kind of an overview about what is happening across the country right now. What are we looking at? Because we've seen this massive push in schools and libraries about what access students and children can have to which materials. And it feels like it's a cultural phenomenon. What is, what's going on? Well, as you said, this is a nationwide phenomenon, right? It's happening all over the United States even here in Massachusetts, which is something that's very important to note. And we recognize that this is a concerted effort um, by a minority of people um, that are looking to control what other people and other people's children have access to. The concern that we keep hearing over and over is just about parents wanting their children to be protected from information that is inappropriate, right? Like what's being called, people will go so far as to say pornographic material or, you know, explicit material or things that are just inappropriate for, for children of a certain age. That's the onus that is publicly being said that it's put behind this. But what's, I feel like, yeah, yeah, go ahead, just <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think anybody wants children to have access to inappropriate material. Um, and I think that Cory Booker said that yesterday during the Senate hearings, right? That the Democrats don't want, you know, small ch children to have access to information that would be harmful to them. And the Republicans don't want, you know, small children to have access to information that would be harmful to them. But I think at the heart of the issue is who gets to decide that, right? Is it the parents? Is it the school district? Is it lawmakers? Who gets to decide? I think that a lot of those voices have been from parents. Mm -hmm. And that's been a very powerful force politically. I wanted to play this clip from a, a 2021 campaign ad for now Governor Glenn Youngkin against then incumbent Terry McAuliffe um, with a testimonial from a parent. As a parent, it's tough to catch everything. So when my son showed me his reading assignment, my heart sunk. It was some of the most explicit material you can imagine. I met with lawmakers. They couldn't believe what I was showing them. Their faces turned bright red with embarrassment. So she's, it's not mentioned in the ad, but she's talking about Toni Morrison's Beloved, which is a book which talks mm. about black people's experiences uh, in the slave trade, which those are the, the you know, the sexual assault and- Absolutely. And her son, it's also not mentioned, is a high school senior who is taking a college level course. Wow. So we wouldn't want our high school seniors at college level reading and understanding to know about history. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> Cameron, I wanted to ask you, you know, about your experience. What's missing for children who don't have access to certain materials? So if a student, you know, largely what's being banned are stories of people from the LGBTQAI community and people of color. I wonder for you, you spoke about books that affected your own experience where you felt seen. Why is this important to you to speak out about? What would they be missing out on? 
Students in my school district from Katy, Texas, saw themselves more in lists of challenged and banned books than they saw themselves reflected in the school libraries. These book bans are targeting identity with viewpoint discrimination that's contrary to the First Amendment. And by not having access to literature, that can serve as lifelines. We don't learn about ourselves with age relevant materials. We don't learn about the way society works. And we can't learn about these tough issues like sexual abuse, as Toni Morrison has written about. What, are, what can people do? And who, who's already doing something to fight back against this big national push? I'm a student at Brandeis and moving here from Texas feels like I'm now living in an alternate reality where I'm in such a lovely community of affirmation. And by creating safe spaces that honor the freedom to read, we can read these books because a campaign ad can show any message and they know that it's a winning message when they're talking about it, knowing that people aren't going to pick up these books. And so it's our responsibility to read these books, read banned books, so we can know what we are talking about and what they are talking about. Um, by creating these safe spaces and by standing up at school board meetings and in state legislatures, we are able to advocate for our freedom to read and uplifting student voices in this activism is so important. On a personal level, how does it feel to be someone that identifies with these books that are being called inappropriate or identify with messages? I mean, there's so much of this, right? This falls in line as well with don't say gay bills and anti-trans legislation that's being proposed across the country. On a personal level, how does it feel to be fighting back against what feels like a massive wave? Their definition of inappropriate is synonymous with my trans identity. This definition has allowed us to be targeted and it does not feel good when I was the only student in the room at my local school board meeting in Texas speaking up for my rights as others, adults in the community were demanding these books be removed. I was the only student in the room and therefore the only one whose future was directly affected by these policies. Students need to be active in the decision-making in collaboration with parents and families and educators so we can make decisions about our own education. And that's what's so upsetting when others are making decisions for us because we need to be at the table. I know that a lot of this is very politically motivated. Obviously, we're looking mm -hmm. at midterms. I wonder what you predict for this movement since we've seen efforts to ban books and newspapers and things like that before. Mm -hmm. And the ACLU is obviously very concerned with First Amendment rights, but it's a long time battle, but this is a surge right now. Where do you see this, this going, Tracy? Well, first I'd like to say to Cameron that the ACLU of Massachusetts has your back, right? This is an issue that we are focused on, we're paying attention to, we are there, we are ready for the fight. The thing is, fights don't stay won. And like you said, you know, censorship has long we have a long history of censorship, right? But we also have the First Amendment. And the First Amendment guarantees us the right to write and read and speak in, in ways that some people might object to, right? But the First Amendment guarantees us those rights. And we have to work as a community to protect those rights that are guaranteed in the Constitution. I wanted to ask you both about this because I think you represent different aspects of it, but it also falls in line with this push against CRT, so critical race theory. And now there are some of the banned books on these lists are books that simply talk about historical incidences that involve black people or the Civil, the civil War or mm -hmm. slavery or segregation. How does that fall into this discussion as well? I mean, that, that are we moving backwards in this way? Is this something that is just politics? I mean, it's, it's, it's a rhetoric that is seemingly growing power. Marginalized people um, 
you know, this week it is LGBTQ, next week it will be Asian folks, next week it will be black folks. Marginalized people are marginalized people, and they are often the subject of these kinds of attacks. So whether it's about CRT, whether it's about LGBTQ life experience, there are those who would seek to erase, erase those experiences, those realities, those histories, those truths. And so there is that effort and the folks that recognize that this is a constitutional right that has to be defended, we have to band together to work towards that. The ACLU of Massachusetts has put out a resource, right? It is a resource that's accessible online for parents and for students and for teachers and librarians who are looking at and considering and facing these kinds of attempts to silence them. Um, and it's a good resource, right? It's something that we, we hope that people will utilize to understand what their rights are. Cameron, I wanted to ask you, when you go home, I don't know if you plan to continue this fight in Texas. I don't know if you feel safe to. I, don't, I just wanted to kind of get a sense of what your plan is. It's certainly tough in Texas, um, but having the back of ACLU of Texas as well is so meaningful um, being joined by other organizers um, in my organization, Students Engage in Advancing Texas. We are banding together. We're joining the front lines of this advocacy, both remotely and in communities across Texas. And I've been active in this. Um, I plan not to step away until there is a time where we can just simply be happy and not worry about who's going to be next to be targeted. We need to be uplifting voices, not marginalizing further the most suppressed voices. Right, because that's the concern, right? It's not about people being exposed to certain things, it's about violence ultimately, right? I, that's the bigger concern. Yes, these types of actions have repercussions. Um, and Cameron spoke to it a little bit, right? That this is, this is about erasing people right, erasing and ignoring the fact that they are here and that they live their lives. And it, it's something that has to be addressed, otherwise it's going to continue. Mm. Well, thank you both so much for joining me. I really appreciate your perspective. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Next, if you think you're from a small, sleepy town, odds are my next guest can find something there to write home about. In Acton, I'm Matt Shearer. In Ashland, I picked a bad day to visit Chelmsford. Welcome to Peabody. From the Auto Mile, I'm Matt Shearer. In Clinton, I'm Matt Shearer. Tewksbury is a town with a market basket, a Papa Gino's, a market basket next to a Papa Gino's. Funny thing happened in Stoneham. In Brooklyn, I'm Matt Shearer. For, more, For the WBZ TikTok account, Matt Shearer takes up followers' challenges to find something, anything cool about their hometowns. And clearly he succeeds. His videos have also helped WBZ's TikTok account win a National Murrow Award this year for excellence in innovation. And perhaps his greatest achievement, correcting this tragic wrong. I recently reported on the 99 being without potato skins for nearly a year and the outrage that ensued. But today's visit was different. Yes! We made our voices heard and corporate America listened. Oh, I miss that smell. They're back, right? Yes, yes dude, finally. <laughs> Matt joins me now. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Tori. I really think being here right now is my greatest achievement. This is the, the peak. The potato yeah. skins and then like GBH with yeah, Tori you're Bedford. Welcome. This you're is awesome. Welcome. That's it. Thanks yeah. for being here. Goodbye. Of course. I, it, I mean, it would have been a slight step up if it were Jim Browdy here, but I mean, I'll take you. I'm wow. just, I'm sorry. Jim Browdy just started growing a beard and I texted him, what? Are you retiring? And he responded, with just the word laughing. <laughs> so I guess not, we'll see. It's not a retirement, all, it's more yeah. of a David Letterman situation where like it's a whole new era of Rowdy, you know, with the beard. The well be that's, David every, Letterman did yeah. that because he retired. Well that's true, but yeah. no, but then he went right back to work. That Matt, doesn't count. I wanna talk about your TikTok. Yes, please. So you started doing this like two years ago, mm -hmm. and how did that start? 
Yeah, so uh, the radio station was looking for new ways to appeal to people, or actually I should say reach people who otherwise have never pressed the AM button on their radio. And where do they hang out? TikTok. And so they wanted me to find a way to get the station TikTok up and running. And I said, well, we're already telling fun short stories on the air. Let's find, let's just kind of adapt that to the social media platform by adding video. And it was tricky at first. I had to find a way to hold both a microphone and my cell phone at the same time. I'm not used to doing two hands at once, but uh, once I sort of figured that out, things started taking off. Uh, people really took to my storytelling style, which I guess is unconventional, sort of a, a blend of uh, traditional news storytelling with the modern news storytelling that people get on social media. The way that you just described it makes it sound like anyone could do it, but you mm -hmm. have this way where you find people. Like in your life, have you found that you are kind of a a character magnet because you find some really interesting people and then you go back and reconnect with them and Sure. Well, I guess my cl click in high school was the weirdos, and I consider myself one of them. And so, yeah, I like to surround myself by people. I, I don't want to say weirdos because that sounds insulting. I was going to say weirdo magnet, but it felt rude. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. No, it's, <laughs> it's, I don't mind calling myself that. I, I'll leave that up to other people to call themselves weirdos. But people who are just, who think different, people who are different, people who will say something into a microphone that I would never expect. There's a lot of phoniness on social media. We all know. We all see it. And I don't want to be phony. I just want to be as real as possible. And you say anybody can do this, but I have this way. I mean, I think authenticity is the biggest thing on social media because people will see right through you if you're just not authentic. What do you get out of it? It seems like a really fun job. You just go out and talk to strangers, which is terrifying for so many people. But mm -hmm. you're going out, and we talked about these, your series where you cover people's small towns and towns in Massachusetts. And when you go out, you don't have any research, right? You're right. just going in completely <laughs> blind and meeting like the most interesting, crazy people mm -hmm. and telling their stories in a way that isn't exploited, right? You're not saying like, look at these crazy people, right. but you're sh but you're showing us, you're taking us somewhere. I'm, I often end up making friends with them and keeping in touch with them. You know, you're right. I, I don't want to be exploita exploitative at all in this endeavor. And you're right that there's no real research in there. Some people get all chirpy in the comments like, why didn't you visit the place where somebody once sewed a patch into a flag? And it's like, well, because that's really not relevant to what I'm doing here. The point is to show up and find something cool. And nine times out of 10, that something is a person. Or, or people, you know, because that's really what makes these small towns great. When people say, come visit my hometown, you'll never find something cool. What they don't realize is that it's the sense of community people have living in a place like that. I grew up in Acton, Massachusetts. I know what it's like to grow up in a small town here, even though Acton, I guess, is kind it's of, kind of big. middle. Yeah, There's not that many it's people. Mid. They're spread out. Right. Yeah. But I know what it's like to have that sense of community where it's like, you know, it's not Boston. It's not Worcester. It's not Lowell. Um, so it's, you know, I, I like finding those groups of people and sh sharing their stories because otherwise their stories just would never be heard. What's interesting to me about this, too, is that you kind of started it during the COVID pandemic, and it really is about, you know, we were all experiencing so much isolation, and what you're doing is just getting out and talking to people. Yeah. I think there's a bigger sure. kind of cultural message to be taken from that about just talking to people. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I think during the pandemic, we all realized how much we missed that. And, uh, and I am the kind of person who loves talking to people sometimes to a fault. You should ask my wife about that. But, uh, I love talking to people. I love, I could get a conversation going about anything. And it, it also makes editing these videos difficult to go listen back to all these conversations and try not to cringe at myself. And, but, uh, it's a fun challenge. And like I said, I really just like being among the people and hearing what they have to say. What was your favorite one to do so far? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, my favorite town specifically or just story I guess in general? TikTok, any TikTok. Yeah, I mean, well, if we're talking in terms of my exploring these small towns, I loved being in Norwood and getting shown around by this amazing dude named Pete who drove this uh, rundown old van called Scooby-Doo. And he would just, he, he just had a way with the town. He knew the town like anybody. He grew up there. He was driving me around, pointing out all these places, telling me these stories that you would never hear on the news, but were just amazing, hilarious stories from his own life. And he was a quirky character too, who just really loves the people that he lives with. He, you know, he offers free rides to people in town in his van, again, called Scooby-Doo, just because he has nothing going on. He's retired and wants to help. I love cool. that. And yes, there's so many to choose from if yeah. people want to check them out uh, on TikTok. It's the WBZ right. News Radio TikTok. Correct. Yes. Uh, we have some incredibly 
brilliant producers here who've put together a quiz for you oh, yeah. about Massachusetts. Right. Um, and so we have some questions. So here's your first question. Play the Jeopardy music. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what was the Fig Newton cookie named for? A, Sir Isaac Newton, B, the town of Newton, or C, newts, which are ground up in the filling? Well, <laughs> well, that, that would make sense that they would grind up newts because it, it is a witch who makes these fig newtons. That's the only way they could be possibly be so delicious. The problem with your question is you call it the town of Newton. I'm pretty sure it's a city. I'm pretty sure they have a mayor. Yeah. So, uh, but I believe that that's the answer. Newton, Massachusetts. I'm just like anchor man, just reading off the thing. <laughs> and you're correct. Yes. Yeah. Uh, what town had the first zip code in America? Aguam, mm. Quincy, Taunton, or Fall River? Oh my gosh, how would I know this? I don't know. I'm trying to think, who has the zip code of 00001? Uh, let's it's go. actually 01001. What? Oh, After so it's, Puerto Rico referred, received the first ever. Okay, so it's binary code. Um, uh, let's go Agawam. Yeah, yeah? you're correct again. Yes. Yeah, you know Massachusetts. That was a oh, tough yeah. one. What is the official, who is the official state cat of Massachusetts? <laughs> a, Persian, B, Tabby, C, Siamese, or our producer's cat, Ginny? Oh, it has to be Ginny. There is no way it could be any other cat. Yes, the official cat of, the, yes. of Massachusetts is Jen's cat, Ginny. Yeah, I've seen Ginny on Instagram because all over. Yeah. Ginny is a Tabby, and Tabby is the official cat. Oh, I, I, you won again! I this test. All right. This uh, is fun. Who, okay, what town is home to a house made of paper? A, Rockport, B, Medford, Medford, okay, C, no. Walpole, D, Amherst. Oh my gosh. My, do, 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 yeah, do, can I do, phone a friend? Do, do. Hey, I have a friend who lives in Medford and do, knows everything do, about do, it. Do. We don't have time for that. Okay, Medford. No, nope, nope. it's Rockport. Mm. Isn't that funny because rock beats rock, paper, paper scissors, wraps. yes. Yeah. I, I was playing rock, paper, scissors <laughs> with my daughter on her way to preschool yesterday, and um, she said, uncuttable paper. So she, she just Whoa. won the game. Yeah. It was a whole new category. So I'm going to have won. to think about that for a while. Right. Lastly, who is the most famous person from Acton? A, Steve, Steve Carell. Carell. B, Howie Carr, C, Taylor Jenkins Reed, or D, mm. Matt Shearer? So, okay, Taylor Jenkins Reed's younger brother is one of my best friends. Oh, um, a name he, dropper. He would probably, my friend Jake would probably love it if I shouted them out. Uh, it's definitely me, though. Yeah, obviously. it's you. Yes. Congrats. Let's go. You did I it. did it. Awesome. Take that, Steve Carell. What are you working on right now, real quick? Um, I'm working on a bunch of amazing stories. I went to the North End, and uh, there's this great Instagram account called North End Stuck Trucks, where they just document all the trucks that get stuck trying to navigate those narrow streets. So I rented a U-Haul and tried to find my way around town and got stuck in uh, so many horrible, horrible ways. Nice. Lots of people honking. I can't it was wait not to watch fun. it. People didn't like it, but I hope that people will like watching it. We can't wait to watch. Thank you Thank so you. much for being here. Matt Shearer, thanks, thanks for joining Tula. us. This was fun. Finally tonight, a look at the new Edward Hopper exhibition at the Cape Ann Museum in Gloucester. GBH Executive Arts Editor Jared Bowen has more. The seagulls sail and squawk over Gloucester, a coastal city and historic fishing port on the north shore of Massachusetts. Like the gulls, artists have also long flocked here, including 100 years ago, Edward Hopper. When you think about Edward Hopper and his ultimate goal to paint sunlight on the side of a house, um, he, in this series of homes, found that opportunity. Oliver Barker is the director of the Cape Ann Museum, which just opened its largest ever exhibition, a show that documents house by house, landscape by landscape, how Edward Hopper found himself as a painter. This exhibition is about place, but it is also about an artist's process um, and learning a new medium uh, and seeing the impact of that. Hopper had been to Cape Ann before, but in 1923, he took root, spending the first of five consecutive summers here painting the place. He was single, 40, and had only ever sold one painting, so his career was stagnant at best. He was far removed from the fame that would come from burrowing into the American psyche with his scenes of urban loneliness, most pointedly rendered in his painting Nighthawks. He was really struggling to make a living. Elliot Bostwick-Davis is the show's curator. She says Hopper was drawn to the sea 
and drew it himself, starting as a young boy growing up in Nyack, New York. He lived right on the waterfront, so from his second story bedroom window, he could actually see vessels um, sailing along the Hudson. And We have in the show an early uh, drawing that he made in pencil, and his mother was an artist, which is another interesting aspect of him. It would be another woman, though, who ultimately changed the course of Hopper's career. In the summer of 23, he met Josephine Nivison, an artist with whom he'd crossed paths before. She had a lot to be proud of. Her work was being shown in the Daniel Gallery in New York. She also had her paintings selected for an important traveling exhibition in 1924 winter, which was going to be shown in both Paris and London. In short order, the pair found both artistic and romantic connections. Also an art teacher, she pushed Hopper, moving him out of his comfort zone where he meticulously planned his illustrations and etchings and into watercolors. Watercolor is harder to control. It's essentially pigment suspended in water. Ultimately, it helps him get out of his own way and to let himself be a little more spontaneous and perhaps tap into more of that subconscious. It's, it's maybe for athletes the way you think of that moment of flow. When you're in it, you know it. And she becomes his biggest champion. Do we have an understanding of why she started to step away from her own career and identify him as the person who should move forward? I think she was a pragmatist. She understood that one of them had to succeed, and I think she saw what it took for him to become Edward Hopper. A year later, the pair was married. Together, the Hoppers toured Cape Ann, often capturing the same subjects like Gloucester's landmark church. Edward was especially drawn to fishing scenes, to the immigrant community in the city's Italian neighborhood, and to the signals of modern times, like utility poles. He also dwelled on dwellings, and many of Hopper's homes still stand, like Anderson's house and Hodgkin's house. What do you think it is about this particular house that speaks to that kind of Hopper? Is it loneliness, mystery? 1928, he comes back, and the painting in the, in the show is really his first house portrait in oil. There's a, almost a split personality between the light facade, uh, which is much more ornate, and then the stark facade on the front, which is much more somber. And perhaps a metaphor now for the light and dark in Hopper's artistic life. After that first summer in Gloucester, his career began to crack open. He sold his first work in more than a decade, this watercolor of a grand Gloucester home. He had a new artistic eye and fervor, and it, Davis says, transformed him in ways that can be traced through the rest of his career. I love uh, motifs that show up here in Gloucester, like in Tony's house we have the fire hydrant on a mound in watercolor. And of course the most famous fire hydrant I think anyone ever painted in American art is in Early Sunday Morning, where we see it uh, as the sole object on the sidewalk casting that long shadow. Hopper, for some reason, loved intersections. He loves this unusually shaped uh, building at the corner of Portuguese Hill. Of course, corner buildings became the subject of his nocturnal drugstore scene of 1927. And it all happened here, at the intersection of Cape Ann, Josephine, and Edward Hopper. That exhibit is on display through October 16th. Head to capeannmuseum.org for more. That's it for tonight. We'll be back tomorrow. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Tori Bedford. Good night. <laughs>